Chapter 10, George Street. Baseball is still baseball, and school is school, but George Street is no more. Oh, sure, if you travel to Norristown today and go west on Elm, you'll come to a street sign that says George. Don't believe it. A street sign does not make a street. A time makes a street, and a people of that time. The sign will tell you nothing, nor will the people who live there today. Go ahead, ask them. Ask them whose front steps they better not sit on. Challenge them to a game of chew the peg. Flip pen knife from shoulder. If it doesn't stick in ground, pull out planted peg with teeth. Or just stand there on the sidewalk outside 802 and close your eyes and listen for the avalanche of coal. Listen for days. You won't hear it. George Street is as gone as 1950. I heard it. I heard it on coal day. Nearly every, every house on the block had a coal-burning furnace. In a front corner of the cellar, beneath the living room, was a plank-walled bin. It held a ton of coal. When the coal truck came, my job was to run to the cellar and open the window above the bin. The truck turned sideways in the street, street and backed up to the curb. From under the truck bed, the coal man pulled the chute, which looked like a sliding board, and fed it through the open cellar window and into our bin. He lifted the hatch and the coal started coming. Avalanching down the chute was such a racket that I had to clamp my hands over my ears. I had to tie a hanky around my nose, too, because of the coal dust that made a black, choking blizzard. I would crouch down under the wash tub, fold my arms about my head, and wait out the bombardment from the enemy battleship and its 16-inch guns. Or, if I wasn't pretending that day, I simply ran outside. Softer sounds came from the Victorial. The Victorial was an early phonograph, a record player. Ours was portable, like a small, boxy suitcase. Whenever I lifted the hinged cover, I was treated to a special scent, a sweet dustiness that suggested slumbering songs, music's bunkhouse. To get the thing to work, I had to crank it, like an old Model T Ford. The crank was a stepped metal rod with a black wooden egg-shaped handle. I placed a record on the turntable, then inserted the rod into a hole in the side of the player and cranked away. I flipped a switch and the record began to spin. Breathlessly, I lowered the needle to the smooth, black edge of the disc. The needle slipped into the first groove, and to ra lu ra lu ra Bing Cosby was crooning. The main sound machine, of course, was the radio. Unlike many people my age, I cannot give a long list of the programs I listen to. What I do recall are three motifs. The Lone Ranger theme song, otherwise known as the William Tell Overture, footsteps walking down hallways and doors creaking open. Beyond that, I simply remember listening and picturing. For radio was a partnership. The radio furnished the sounds and the listeners supplied the pictures. TV and movie screams have shaded us from the evocative power of sound. Our eyes enslave us. Seeing is believing. In contrast to TV, which asks us merely to turn it on and become a passive dartboard, radio asked us to meet it halfway, to concrete the moment. The resulting pictures in our head had a depth of reality, possible only when the camera is the person. Despite my love of radio, I soon gave in to the lure of television. The first TV set in my corner of the West End belonged to the Beswicks up on Crone Street, a block west of George. Butchie, Beswick, Pop Butchie Beswick's popularity zoomed. Day after day, a mob of kids sat on the Beswick's living room rug after school, Google-eyed and gaping like many guppies, like so many guppies at Willie the Worm on the ten-inch black and white screen. Mrs. Beswick must have been a saint. Over the time, the mob diminished, one cross-legged floor sitter at a time, as new families acquired television sets. Our family got one in 1950, a 12-inch Magnavox. When I was in third grade and home with my kidney illness, Doctor's orders confined me to my bed, but I made such a fuss that I was finally allowed to be carried downstairs and plopped in a chair to watch TV for one hour, not a minute more. Television and I grew up together. Meanwhile, movies seduced me with Technicolor and 3D and Cinemascope. By the time I got my driver's license, the only radio in my life was in the family car. On, Ju on July 20th, 1969, Apollo 11 astronauts rode the lunar module Eagle to the surface of the moon. Like much of the world, I was in front of a TV set, watching fuzzy images of the event. Eagle launching from the mother spacecraft, e spacecraft, 
Eagle orbiting the moon, eagle coming in lower, lower, skimming lunar hills and craters, seeking a spot to land. I strained my eyes watching, and still I wasn't seeing, not well enough, the pictures in my head. I rushed outside to my car, I turned on the radio, and that's where I experienced the landing on the moon. I had rediscovered what I knew back on George Street. Listening is believing. And so is remembering, remembering George Street. Cooling myself with a popsicle stick fan, playing chew the peg, smoking punk, digging up the grass between the front wall bricks, my most hated chore after taking out the garbage, Mr. Freilich's long-handled grocery grippers, allowing him to reach the highest shelf and pull down a box of cereal, purple ribbons on a door, meaning someone had died in that house, pouring Morton salt on the fat summer slugs that left silver trails along the bricks, Quaker oats, bathtub-shaped Hudson cars, the bug truck sprang everything, including me, with mosquito poison. Cat's eye marbles in the dirt. Bono's fruit and vegetable bus. And, on a winter's morning, a slow white plug of cream slushing up the cap of the milk bottle on our front porch step. The bread man, the rag man, the rag man's horse. Itself slow and drooping as a sag of rags, sack of rags, as if every clop upon the street would be its last. The ragman's mournful warbling bleat, rags, the slad, slow, passing George, heading for Cone, Noble, Buttonwood, westward, rags, clop, clop, rags, clop, clop. That's the end of chapter 10. Please read over your questions, go back into the text to answer them before moving on to the next chapter.